Sweet, thanks. All right, so this is the second to last lecture and our last lecture on the topic of uh, neural networks. Just um, a couple of organizational things. So I posted um, a practice exam on uh, courseworks. So the format of the final will be slightly different from the midterm because it's now a take home exam. So uh, in uh, exactly a week, next Monday will be the final. You will have 24 hours and it's gonna be open book. Um, it's gonna be some multiple choice questions and it will require you to do some uh, coding locally well, lo or locally could also mean like in Google Colab or something, but there's, uh, you need to run some code. And some examples of what this will look like are on the uh, practice exam. So please uh, try out the practice exam and uh, use that uh, to guide your studies. All right, so today we'll um, keep going talking about convolutional neural networks and some more advanced neural network techniques. The first thing I wanted to um, recall or maybe highlight is um, the difference between um, convolutional neural networks and other algorithms that we looked at so far. So here, um, I'm looking at two different data sets, uh, MNIST and um, a version of MNIST where, where I do a permutation of all the pixels. So at the top and at the bottom, um, you can see uh, at the top the MNIST data set and at the bottom the permuted uh, MNIST data set. And so at the top, you can clearly see uh, five, zero, four, one, and nine, whereas at the bottom, this basically looks like noise. So here I'm um, drawing a permutation of the pixels and then uh, permute the pixels the same way in each of the images. So now, um, let's say you train a logistic regression model on uh, the top one and you train one on the bottom one. How will they be different? Or if you train a random forest model, how will they be different? And the maybe slightly surprising answer is um, they're not different. The bottom looks uh, exactly like the top to any of the models we talked about so far. What, we're, uh, what I'm permuting here, what I'm shuffling here, is uh, the order of the columns. And none of the algorithms we looked at care about the order of the, the columns at all. However, the convolutional neural networks we looked at last time, uh, they actually use the 2D structure of the image. And so a convolutional neural network can work on the top one, but it's basically um, useless on the bottom one because the, um, the 2D structure of the image is now meaningless. A neighborhood doesn't mean anything anymore. And so uh, to highlight this, I'm uh, comparing a fully connected and a convolutional neural network on uh, these two data sets. So this is a very small fully connected neural network with one hidden layer. So on the left hand side, so fully connected network, one hidden layer with 512 units, uh, rectified linear uh, activation and uh, 10 output uh, nodes for uh, the 10 classes. And on the right hand side is a relatively small convolutional neural network with um, uh, three times three uh, filters in the first layer with uh, 32 feature maps, so 32 different filters learned, then a two by two max pooling, then another uh, three by three convolutional layer, another max pooling layer, uh, flattening layer, and then a densely connected layer with 64 units. Um, before we go over to, to the comparison between these two data sets, the MNIST and the uh, permuted MNIST, Maybe one thing that um, I want to highlight here is 
that if you look at the uh, number of parameters in these two models, the one on the left, the densely connected one, has many more parameters than the one on the right. So um, it's a factor of, uh, what is it, eight or something like this um, between the two. And so, or, no, 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 actually more like a factor of, of six. Um, and so you can see that even though the architecture on the right looks much more complicated, the actual number of free parameters is much smaller. And if you look at which layers these parameters in, are in, they are actually not in the filter layers. Let me find my mouse. The first layer actually has very few parameter and the second convolutional layer only had like relatively few parameter and nearly all of the parameters are in the densely connected layer in the end. So this is something um, that I think is quite important to keep in mind is that conv uh, convolutional layers actually have uh, very few parameters compared to densely connected layers. Anyway, so here um, I'm looking at the original data set and these are the, um, the training curves for a convolutional network and a densely connected network. And um, you can see in blue and uh, orange, the convolutional network, it uh, learns much more quick, quickly and then also gets better performance. The densely connected network on, uh, on the training set, both of them probably achieve near 100% accuracy, but um, the densely connected network learns slower and also doesn't do as well on the validation data set. Okay, so if we have the original data, the real MNIST data set, uh, this no, uh, knowing the 2D structure of the image helps us and the convolutional neural network can exploit that. Now, if you look at um, the shuffle data set, um, this looks uh, quite different. So the red and green curve, the dense network, is, uh, looks exactly the same because to the dense network, the two data sets look exactly the same. However, the convolutional neural network now trains much slower and also doesn't really achieve a very good performance. The reason is that now the 2D structure of the image is uh, completely meaningless. But again, I want to highlight this is, um, this is different from all the other models which we looked at so far, which we, uh, really don't care about the order of the features. So basically everything that we talked about so far would have the same performance on the left and on the right. All right, so this was just sort of an addendum to uh, talking about convolutional neural networks in general. Before we go to the sort of more advanced techniques for neural networks, uh, there's one technique that is very old and very simple, but very, very powerful, and uh, that is data augmentation. And so later I'm going to show a task, uh, an image recognition task, uh, where I'm trying to recognize some snakes. So this is one of the example images. So we know the convolutional neural network can take advantage of uh, the 2D structure of the image. So it's a little bit, it's somewhat transition invariant, uh, at least locally in the image. But it's not, uh, but, uh, it's not very invariant. It's not invariant to many things that uh, we as a human would think are somewhat irrelevant uh, for the content of the image. So if I want to recognize that this is, this is a snake, it doesn't matter really if I mirror the image. If I mirror the image, it's still the same snake. If I rotate the image a bit, it's still the same snake. Um, if I crop it slightly differently, it's still the same, same snake. However, to the convolutional neural network, all of these images look very different. So here, some of these are stretched, some of them are rotated, zoomed in, flipped, and so on. And um, here, all of these probably like are recognizable appearances of the snake. And um, so all of these would make good tr uh, training images.
So for the, but um, so for the convolutional neural network, all of them are different training images. And so if you add them to your training data set, you can basically get a training data set that is infinitely large by trying all kind of different variations of small rotations or sm small shifts, stretching, and so on. And this is something that is used uh, basically whenever you train any algorithms based on images um, that you add augmentations. So I already said like things that are commonly used are rotations, random crops, or mirroring, um, or stretching. Uh, the important thing here is to make sure these reflect realistic and relevant variability. So for the snake, for example, if I turn this um, completely on the side, or if I uh, turn this upside down, then maybe it's not as recognizable anymore. Maybe it's a reasonable assumption to know to, that the eyes are on top. So if I do a left right mirror of this image, then um, it still makes sense the, as the image. If I do an up-down mirror of the image, it doesn't really make sense as an image anymore. However, um, which translations or which uh, transformations make sense depends on your domain. If you um, have very aligned images, so let's say you have X-ray images that are perfectly aligned of like a torso, then um, depending on what you're looking at, maybe um, a left-right mirror makes sense, but if they're aligned, then translations and crops don't make sense. Or um, maybe even left-right mirroring doesn't make sense if you're looking at the heart, because like the body's asymmetric and um, um, so basically um, you know that the heart is on the right. So there's two great questions um, in the chat. So one is, um, one, one question I ask, why is this helpful? Um, so, uh, bec so basically we're adding more misalignment here. The reason that this is helpful is, is uh, whenever your data is not aligned, you, need to, you can uh, model the variability that comes from the data not being aligned. <coughs> if your test data is all perfectly aligned, don't do transformations that don't correspond to this alignment. But usually, if you do image recognition, aligning the data is really hard. So your test data will not be perfectly aligned. And so you're trying to model the variability in the alignment by um, adding this variability to the trained data set. Another great question is um, whether we can change the algorithm so uh, that the algorithm is invariant to all of these transformations. And um, that's possible. And people have done like quite a bit of work on this. Um, usually it's quite tricky and not really worth the hassle. Um, it's often easier to, um, to just apply the transformation to the images. So, Oh my God, it's been a couple of years, but there was um, uh, a competition, probably was on Kaggle, where um, recognizing plankton, and so you had images of plankton, um, which are like small, uh, I guess, tiny animals or microscopic organisms. And uh, because they were floating in water, they could be rotated um, 360, and all rotations made sense because they were just like uh, in liquid under a microscope. And uh, so um, a person that was, that, um, was working on neural uh, architectures at that time basically made, um, created a neural network that was completely invariant to these rotations and uh, won the competition. Um, but generally, people um, don't hard code this in the architecture. And it's also quite tricky to hard code some of these things. So the random crops, for example, you can't really do that because you're throwing away some data and you're, um, or the zooming in, it's like very, very hard to encode this in the architecture. Um, and so you can't really get rid of the um, of, uh, image augmentation, even if you encode some of the invariances in the architecture.
So this is luckily very easy to do with uh, Keras. So there's an image data generator that um, has many options. So I just want to mention that this exists and you can look at the Keras documentation for all the details. So this is something um, you can use in the homework. And this basically creates an infinite stream based on some data set. And you can give it the data set either as a matrix or a NumPy array or a list of images, I think. Um, there's also a thing where you can create a flow from directory. So I link the documentation down there. If you have a folder of images in a direct, like that are structured by directory, um, you don't have to load the images manually. You can use this flow from directory in Keras. So that might help with the homework. Um, and then it, when you're fitting the model, um, you're doing, uh, instead of model.fit, you do model.fit generator, which then takes this infinite stream of data. Um, if you do that, you also have to define the steps per epoch, which is, um, because the data set is infinite, you have to say how many steps uh, for epoch and here basically this uh, the length of the train data set divided by 32 so the epoch is um, number of samples divided by the batch size um, here's the question what is future wise center um, this is an educated guess i would have to check the documentation but uh, i assume this is uh, the mean so future wise center i assume is computer future wise mean um, and feature-wise standardization is computer feature-wise uh, uh, standard. And so, okay, wait, let me think. So what does this, oh yeah, so this probably, so uh, means that th the mean is subtracted from all the generated data. And so this has, uh, basically, this does some scaling for you. And so here, these two um, options here basically correspond then to standard scalar. There's another good question, which is, should steps per epoch always be this, or can we hard code a reasonable number? And what would be the pros and cons? And actually, I, I was thinking about this when I prepared the slide, and I don't have a good answer. Um, I think it, what it will mostly influence is the learning rate schedule, because the learning rate schedule depends on the epoch. But honestly, I'm not entirely sure. OK. Um, Yeah, so this is, um, whenever you work with image data, this is something you really want to do. And you want to think about what, what are things that make sense, uh, what are transformation that makes sense for my data, like uh, what alignments are fixed in the data and what alignments do I want to uh, jiggle a bit. Uh, so there's a question about scaling, um, whether um, mean subtraction is more useful than normalizing by the maximum intensity. Um, I think both can be used. The thing is, if, if you're looking at general images, usually the mean, it depends. Um, it depends on how aligned your images are. If you look at generic images, then the mean is probably very non-informative. If you look at images like in the homework that are quite aligned, then maybe the mean uh, is informative. Um, so I think it depends a little bit on um, the structure of the data. All right. So, oh yeah, another thing before we go into uh, some more advanced techniques is um, there's been a lot of work on interpreting neural networks and I want to only or in particular, uh, interpreting convolutional neural networks. Actually, I only want to uh, briefly mention some of the um, slightly older work that maybe helps us understand a little bit better what's going on in these networks. 
So in the first layer, um, you can just visualize the weights because the weights are applied to an image. And so you can just look at the weights and they are filters. Um, this here is I uh, from um, you know, network one on ImageNet. So, uh, I'm not sure if this is, maybe this is for LXNet. I'm not sure which architecture this was. But here in the top left, this is the weights for um, the first layer. So there's uh, nine feature maps or nine filters that are applied to the three RGB channels. And um, uh, what these uh, nine uh, features that were learned, what they basically encode is um, gradients in different directions. So this, 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 there's these uh, three here are similar to the edge detectors that I showed last time in the convolution. Um, and so these will find um, like slightly tilted um, edges. These are like um, rising edges. And these are sort of horizontal falling edges. And um, the one on the bottom left here is again an edge in the same a similar direction as this one, but this is a, a, a we would say higher frequency edge. So it's a an basically it's a smaller edge. Um, well, or an edge that's not as wide. Um, so this would find smaller texture in the data. Uh, if you, um, so this is something you can find, these are tip, and oh yeah, and the other ones here, these are basically color contrast. So this is a, this is showing an edge between orange and blue, and this is showing an edge between uh, cyan and green. So these are opposite colors, basically. So these are color contrast features. They're learned uh, or color edges. And you can um, see like in neural networks, these are generally the things that are learned in the uh, lowest layer. These are, uh, edge detectors in different orientations, and then uh, color contrast detection. This is actually also what, um, this is quite similar to what's in the uh, human visual system. Um, these filters are all, these edge detectors are also known as uh, Gabor filters. And um, basically, anytime you train a neural network on images, you will see a bunch of these uh, with different rotations and different scales. But then if you look at the features that are on the, uh, say the second la uh, layer, this is actually oh, quite tricky. You can't really look at uh, the filters there because the filters will be applied to the result of these uh, layer one convolutions. So there's gonna be the layer one filter is gonna be applied, then there's gonna be a nonlinearity and then the layer two filters will be applied. So they don't really work on the image space. However, we can uh, project them down into the image space in, in different ways. One of the earlier works from 2014 is a deconvolution, which is basically just um, doing a convolution in the opposite direction. So this um, holds the activation uh, fixed in one of the layers and projects it down into the image space, uh, basically just by computing the convolutions um, in the other direction. And this gives you some idea of what the higher level filters are detecting. And so you can see, um, well, here these are horizontal structures, here these are vertical structures that have a blue uh, orange uh, gradient. You'll see small circles, like bigger circles, uh, vertical structures and crosses. And so this is, this is sort of a way to visualize how these higher level um, filters work. You can also look at image patches that maximally, um, like image patches from your train data that maximally excite a given um, uh, a given filter or a given feature map. Um, so basically meaning the one for which the response is highest. 
And so here, if you look at uh, the first layer, you can see that for this one, as I claimed, basically these diagonal edges are the ones that um, give the best response. For this one here, um, you get uh, these color gradients as the best response. For this one here, you get things that are green as the best response. For this one, you get like finer, uh, uh, finer edges as the best responses. And you can do the same thing for uh, higher level features. And you can see that, well, here you have um, really circles of particular sizes. Um, this here actually looks like maybe fur texture or it's like a textured filter. This here is more of a yellow filter. This is a, more of a grid texture and so on. And um, the idea is that uh, as you go deeper in a convolutional neural network, each layer learns something that is a slightly more abstract representation of the image or something that is slightly uh, more abstract um, and more abstract feature of the image. So here you can see that these different circles, they're all uh, quite different sizes and look differently, but the, um, they're all captured using the same filter. Um, I'm not actually going to explain what deconvolutions are. If you're interested, then uh, you can read this paper that I link there. But um, the idea is basically that you um, uh, go from the hidden layer, um, you invert the filter, or I mean, you're not really inverting the filter. You're basically applying the filter to the hidden layer, and uh, you take the output as the image. This is sort of a way how you can go uh, down from the hidden layer uh, to the image space. You're basically, you're still applying a convolution. Uh, you're just transposing the convolution. Uh, the real question is, how do you go through backwards to the max pooling layers? Um, I didn't want to spend too much time on this, though. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Here there are some examples of um, if you go even higher. So for this network, if you go to layer three, you can see that um, here is the structures that are um, found by different um, uh, by different units. So each of these three by three grid corresponds to one uh, feature map or uh, one filter um, in the neural network. And you can see that this one here uh, mostly detects wheels. This one here detects faces. Um, this one here actually seems already pretty specific to birds, maybe. Um, this one here seems sort of sports related. This is actually quite interesting, particularly this one, because this is learned on ImageNet, and ImageNet doesn't have a category for humans. So this network learned that there's humans in the images without uh, it ever having to be told that humans exist. And so then if you go higher up, you get more and more um, like complex objects. So you get like um, things that correspond to dog faces, uh, things that correspond to birds, things that correspond to water maybe, and so on. Um, This one here mostly like has has this very fine has a, there lots of small holes, so it's responding to keyboards and cheese graters maybe. Um, yeah, so the idea is that the deeper you go into this network, um, the more abstract it, uh, the concepts are that can be learned by the filters. There is another technique which makes uh, somewhat prettier pictures, which is a little bit later. Uh, I give a, this is on uh, distill.pub, which is like an online journal. Um, I highly recommend looking at this. This uses actually um, the gradients. And so this tries to find an image that gives the maximum response um, for a given neuron. And so um, these look maybe a little bit psychedelic. And so you can see that on the first layer, you get something that has edges in different frequencies in different directions. Then um, in a higher layer, you get something like textures, then patterns, then object parts, and then finally something like uh, full objects. And so um, here, this maybe it's like 
clothing, I think they said dog noses. Um, and you can see, and these are maybe uh, dog faces. And uh, so you can see that as you go up in the layer, um, basically the concepts that are captured again are more and more abstract. And here in this paper, I mean, the nice thing about this paper is they could basically figure out the optimization to work well so that um, these images actually look nice and interesting and um, show us something about what was what is recognized by each of the layers. All right, so this was just to give you a little bit more of an uh, intuition of what happens in these convolutional neural networks. Um, Now I want to talk about some of the uh, more recent developments and more advanced techniques for training neural networks. And I did not, oh my god, sorry, I did not record. Or did I? No, I'm recording. That's interesting. Um, okay, never mind. I didn't press start record. Okay, so the first technique that I want to talk about is um, dropout. So um, this is actually sort of from a newer techniques. This is uh, a little bit older. Um, I don't actually remember when this is from. Maybe 20... 11, 2012, something around that time. Um, so early 2010s at least. Um, dropout is a technique that um, sort of all the things we talked about before, they were used in the 90s. This is one of the first things that we're talking about that is uh, more recent. Um, and so the idea of dropout is quite similar, I would say, to the data augmentation only that um, instead of just changing the input, you're changing uh, also things in the hidden layers. Because we really don't know what's going on in the hidden layers, the way that um, uh, dropout works, it basically uh, turns off some of the hidden units randomly and um, does that uh, differently every time it sees an example. So in a sense, you're injecting noise into the training process by uh, turning off some of the uh, neurons. So this is something that's typically applied to uh, densely connected layers, not to convolutional layers. So I think you can, I guess you can also apply it to convolutional layers if you want. Um, so there's a JMLR paper about this. This is private in quite a lot of detail. So this is uh, from Jeff Hinton. And um, the rate of the neurons that you, um, that is uh, removed is often quite high. So sometimes it's even 50% of the units are set to zero in each layer. Or sometimes it's like, let's say it's somewhere between 10 and 50%. And um, so during the learning, every time you see an example, you randomly mask out some of the hidden units. Um, if, you do, if you're doing predictions, you use all of the weights, but you downweight them by one minus the dropout rate. Um, the reason is that if you have a nonlinearity here, um, so let's say you have a ReLU, and the ReLU has a particular threshold at uh, zero. And um, the magnitude of the things coming in during uh, prediction would be quite different from the things that come in during training if you um, have many more units contributing. And so basically, there's a multipl multiplicative factor that downweights off the contributions because you have more contributions than you had during training. And so, yes, um, I mean, during test time, dropout is just um, turned off, but you have to uh, adjust basically 
using this factor of one minus the dropout rate before the nonlinearity in, in the next layer. And so there's a question which is, what is the difference between dropping out and just using a smaller layer? The difference is that um, at every time you see an example, you drop out differently. And so, and for each example, you drop out differently. So if you um, iterate over your, as you iterate over your train data set, you're not learning um, a subset of the weights, you're learning all of the weights, but they're all learned on slightly different examples. And so even if you see the same example twice, because different weights are dropped out, um, it will be a, a different network that's learning it basically. And so this is only used during training, so you wouldn't do this during prediction or during validation. Um, one way to interpret this is um, that was put forward in this paper is thinking of this as an ensemble. You can think of each possible dropout configuration as a different neural network that shares some of their weights. So instead of thinking of this as being one smaller network, each possible dropout combination of the different units will give you one smaller network. But there's actually um, exponentially many of these smaller networks that you're then averaging. Um, at least this is sort of true for uh, if you do drop out in the last layer. Um, in practice, people usually use drop out more towards the early layers, not as much towards the last layers. But um, the idea is that you don't have one fixed subset, but that you basically, you it's like loading many, many, many uh, neural networks at the same time that share some of the weights. Another way you can think about this is um, that the neural network becomes more robust because each neuron can't rely too much on the presence of the other neurons because they might randomly go away. And so they're trying to sort of complement each, so the different weights try to complement each other in some sense, but also uh, can't rely on each other completely. Uh, you can do this very simply um, in um, in Keras. There's just a dropout layer, and you can put it after uh, your uh, nonlinearity. Um, I mean, for ReLU, I guess it doesn't matter whether you put it before or after. Um, if you, and for 10H, I guess it also doesn't matter because 10H is zero is zero. Um, but I mean, it, this way it's easiest to write down in Keras. And so here I'm using dropout of 0.5 uh, on this layer and on this layer, on the output of this layer. So dropout is, um, so I would think of dropout as a way to regularize. I mean, you can think of it also as doing like um, sort of weird form of data augmentation where you're adding noise inside the network. Um, but you're definitely making it harder for the model to overfit because you're changing up the data set every time. So um, it's going to be really hard for a network to fit the data really well because you're kind of interfering with the learning. So this also allows you to learn uh, larger and deeper networks without overfitting as much. But uh, it also slows down training because um, you add so much noise to the training process. Um, if you look at the notebooks, I couldn't get it to run better on MNIST, but in, in theory, you can run, uh, get better results on MNIST using dropout than using vanilla neural network. But um, I didn't have a GPU to run the experiments. I should have probably run it on Google Colab, but I didn't. Um, but yeah, so basically, when this was published, this was a new state of the art for MNIST. Um, which back then people still care, somewhat cared about at least. And so answering some of the uh, questions again, so when does it help? So it, it helps to avoid overfitting and it helps if, uh, to avoid uh, neural networks that are maybe much larger than what you would expect 
given the training set size. All right, so this is one of the techniques. Another technique is uh, batch normalization. And before we talk about batch normalization, I want to talk about a problem that has been well known for um, many years in the neural network uh, community. And it was a problem, I guess, going as far back as the 90s. Um, so, uh, so dropout helps you prevent overfitting. But actually, people found that if they try to learn very deep neural networks, Overfitting is not the biggest problem. The biggest problem might be that they can't even fit the networks. So here you can see um, the training error and test error on um, the on CIFAR 10, which is like a low resolution image recognition task. Um, on the left hand side with 20 layer, oh, so on 20 layers and uh, with 56 layers. And so the really interesting thing to pay attention to here is that if you add more layers, the training error goes up. This is somewhat unexpected. So here, the red line is above the yellow line. Usually you would think if you add more parameters to the model, if you allow to have a more um, complex model, you can overfit the data more. However, it turns out that doing back propagation through a network that's very deep um, doesn't really work that well. Like people call this um, vanishing gradients. So basically, if your network is that deep, you're, um, it's very hard to get any signal through this deep network and your training process will be very slow. But actually, it's not only that it's slow, it will never converge to anything good. So here, this is like uh, plotted against the number of iterations, but even if you wait a very, very long time, um, your training error will not become zero. And so there's a problem that's not really about overfitting, there's a problem of optimization it's not possible to easily train very deep neural networks. If they have uh, too many layers, that propagation stops working and we can't train them anymore. So, and people have been working on this problem, um, yeah, again, since the 90s, though they didn't make that much progress until recently. Um, so batch normalization is one of the ways um, that to fix this. So the question is, doesn't Relu solve the gradient issue? I'm pretty sure this one is trained with Relu's. Uh, so, so the answer is empirically no. And I'm pretty sure you get the same problem even with leaky, leaky relus. Um, one of the things that uh, helped a little bit is what's known as batch normalization. And um, a lot has been written about batch normalization and why it works and why it doesn't work. And I've seen many explanations and people come up with new explanations uh, still. Um, let me first explain um, what it does. The idea is that for each uh, time you do a gradient update, which is each mini batch, um, you want to um, basically normalize the mini batch to look like all the other mini batches. Um, and so in a sense, you're trying to decrease uh, the variance during training. The operation that is being done is uh, for each mini batch, you compute the mean, mu b is the mean of the mini batch, and you compute the variance of the mini batch. And then you normalize uh, each mini batch um, by subtracting the mean and dividing by uh, standard deviation, 
plus some epsilon. Uh, this is just to, not, to avoid dividing by zero mostly um, and maybe a little bit of smoothing. So, so this is an operation that would be applied to every layer. So for every layer, you subtract the mean of the mini batch and you divide by the standard deviation of the mini batch. However, if you do that, um, that basically that means the model can't um, really pick the um, where in the ReLU or where in the nonlinearity it wants to put the threshold because it's going to be zero mean afterwards. And so um, this operation doesn't have any parameters, so, uh, any loadable parameters. But after this operation, we do another operation, which is we multiply by gamma and add beta. And these are um, scale and shift parameters that are actually is, uh, learned during training. So you're basically, you're, you're normalizing away the mean and standard deviation in each mini batch. And then you add new parameters that allow you to um, have the network learn what it thinks should be um, the scaling and the offset um, globally. And so this is a little, a little bit of a weird operation, but people have used this for many years now and it seems to work really, really well. Um, and yeah, as I said, so the, the original um, intuition was that this helps um, by reducing the variance in the gradients. Later work, I think, sh showed that this is not really the case. And um, so I think the best explanation I've seen so far is basically that the reparameterization of adding in this gamma here um, makes the Hessian more well behaved. But um, I'm not sure. I'm sh Um, oh, so um, yeah, I'm sure since since I saw that, people um, found different um, found different explanations. So one question is, what do the axes represent here for between dense layers? So it represents the activation. And um, so usually people apply this, uh, I think, before the nonlinearity. I think I've seen both camps. Some people do it before, some people after the nonlinearity. And I would have to check which one is the, currently the preferred way. I think um, the, original the original paper did it not the way that people do it right now. That's what I remember, but I forget. I Maybe I have it on the next slide if it's before or after nonlinearity. Um, yeah, so it's after nonlinearity. And I think in the paper I did it before nonlinearity. Um, so Xi are just the activations in the layer before nonlinearity. Um, another question is wouldn't putting the data right under the cusp of the ReLU be a good thing? Um, I would say it depends. Um, I think you want to give the network the flexibility. If you don't add in these parameters, empirically it doesn't work. Again, you can do this pretty, uh, pretty simply with, uh, with Keras. There's a batch normalization layer, um, which you can add. And yeah, depending on the flavor of the day, you can do it before or after the activation. One thing that's uh, interesting is that because of this normalization here that's per mini batch, actually, if you try to write down the gradient of this thing, it's nightmarish. And um, so, but luckily, no one ever has to write down a gradient again because we have, um, we have autograd that's in all our deep learning frameworks. If you try to write down the gradient for this by hand, um, you're basically guaranteed to make a mistake. So 
so here's a comparison of, on a small, uh, small example. I think I'm doing MNIST again between using batch normalization, not using batch normalization. Um, the solid lines are with batch normalization, and the um, batch lines are without batch normalization. And so basically, learning can go much faster with batch normalization often. And this is even more pronounced for larger networks. Unfortunately, you still have this problem. So I'm actually not, I should, uh, I should see, but it might be that they're actually using already batch normalization when they're still having this problem. So batch normalization helps you to learn faster and helps you to learn deeper neural networks, but still doesn't allow you to go to 56 layers. Um, so the next innovation that came after this is um, what is known as uh, residual neural networks. This is something that really is mostly applied in convolutional neural networks, while batch normalization is applied basically everywhere. So residual neural networks are um, now used basically anytime you want to do um, any computer vision problems. And so the solution to the problem that they found is that um, they basically added uh, a shortcut connection that allows you to skip layers. And so um, let's say you have a weight layer and a ReLU. So you have an input, you have a weight layer, a ReLU, a weight layer, and a ReLU. And um, instead of uh, directly learning this, what you're learning is a function uh, f that you add to the identity function. So you can think of this as learning the residual. So um, you're not learning the output for x, you're learning uh, how is the output, sorry, how is the output different from the identity? And um, this makes it very easy to have layers do nothing, which helps in learning. So basically, it's very easy for a network to learn the identity. And this makes it easier to propagate the gradients through the network because the gradient can flow along this identity transformation. Um, so this is very sort of simple and obvious if you um, if the layers have the same size. So uh, if the layers have different size, then um, usually there's like, a, uh, it's a linear transformation instead of using the identity. So one question is, what's the point of the weight layer if we just follow the identity? Um, the, the thing that's computed is this. So we don't use the identity, we use the identity plus whatever is computed. So the weight layer says, um, how should the result be different from the identity? And um, the two results are added together and then the ReLU is applied. And similarly, if you do back propagation, the uh, gradient propagates through the weight layer and also through the identity. And so this allowed uh, people to learn uh, much, much deeper neural networks. So this is, um, this here on the left hand side is uh, VGG19, which I think was named for having 19 layers. Um, which, okay, I, I should I should write the years to, uh, on all of these. Um, I don't entirely remember when that was, maybe 2015, 2016, around that time, maybe. Um, this was state of the art on ImageNet. And so you could see it had like some uh, 3D convolution layers, max pooling layer, convolution, sorry, three times three convolution layer, max pooling, convolution, max pooling, convolution, uh, max pooling convolution, max pooling. So this was already this network, and then here like fully connected. So this was with 19 layers. This is already um, 
uh, much deeper than uh, the things that we had on MNIST that we saw like from the 90s. So, uh, and this data set is obviously much bigger, but 19 layers is not, not as deep as people thought we could go. And so um, what people wanted would be something like, let's say we have want to learn 34 layers. And so here is a 34 layer network. One is like a plain network and the other one is a residual network where there's these skip connection added that allow you to skip layers, uh, to skip blocks of two layers at a time. This dashed uh, here means that um, the input and, uh, sorry, the, the identity is actually a linear layer because the feature maps are of different size. And so here layering this um, 34 layer play network is very hard because of the backpropagation issues. And uh, the residual uh, network actually, it's uh, possible to learn that. And so here, um, this, is, uh, this is from the ResNet paper again. Um, so you can see here that um, for the plain network, if you compare um, an 18 layer network um, with a 34 layer uh, network, you can see the, um, I think the solid one is the training and the small one is the validation accuracy. Um, you can see that the error is, error is lower for the 18 layers. So adding more layers makes it worse, both on the training and the test set. If you don't use batch normalization, it's hard to train on the training set even. Sorry, not batch normalization, residual connections. If you use, um, if you add these residual connections, um, the 18 layer network is about the same, but if you add uh, 34 layers, the model can learn uh, something better so it can actually use the capacity of these um, additional layers. And so here we see that more layers help if you use the residual uh, architecture. And so here, um, this is when ResNet came out. Do I have this year? Oh yeah, so uh, that was 2015. Um, so VGG was the, uh, I guess, 19 layer uh, network. And then there was GoogleNet and um, Inception. And there was, these were like the comp uh, competing networks. This is the error on the ImageNet data set, either classification, um, it's a, a thousand class classification. Um, top one error means it got the correct class. Top five error means the correct class was among the top five scored classes. And so you can see the ResNet that I did with um, 34 layers was better than the VGG thing um, and about as good as sort of the competitors. But then they went kind of crazy and um, uh, added 152 layers. And uh, then it uh, beat the state of the art. So yeah, this was um, 2015. So the current state of the art is 11.5%, uh, uh, top one error. You can feel, uh, you, can, you can look at the current state of the art uh, here on this side, they still change like every now and then. People are less obsessed with ImageNet these days um, because like the data set has lots of limitations and people are more interested in detection and so on. Um, so back when, uh, but it's still something people look at uh, for evaluating architectures. Top one error means classification error. So did it get so accuracy, did it get the, the class correct? Top five error means um, is the correct class within the, 
the five highest scoring classes. Because there's a thousand classes and uh, many of the classes are quite similar. Like there's, I don't know how many dog breeds in these a thousand classes. And so here these rest nets, so they are from 2015, but they're still actually uh, quite commonly used and like quite, um, uh, quite popular architectures. If you want to um, do a network like this yourself in Keras, um, it's a little bit more tricky because you can't use the sequential interface anymore. Because now we don't just have a sequence of layers, we have these skip connections. And to do this, we have to add what is known as the uh, functional API. And the functional API, um, well, in the functional API, you have to um, use an input layer which we didn't have to use before. And then each layer is applied to the layer before. And so here, um, you're applying the dense layer to the inputs, which returns like an abstract tensor, which you then apply another dense layer to. And so this here is a densely connected neural networks written uh, using the uh, functional API, so this would, you could express this as the sequential API, but um, just as an example to show you how the functional API looks like. So you create an input, then you apply the layer to the input, then you apply the next layer to this layer, and then you um, apply the next layer to this layer, and so this would be the output. Then um, you create a model instance, which is a, a new class. So instead of sequential, you'll have a model, model and um, you declare what is the input, and what is the output, and then you can fit it similarly to the sequential, um, uh, yeah, to the sequential interface. Here I'm um, doing a convolutional network um, on MNEST again because I'm. Uh, I don't want to wait for too long. This is actually um, like a tiny network, so you wouldn't really do residual connections on this network. I just want to show you the API of uh, how you could do this. So here we have an input layer, we have two convolutions, a max pooling layer, two convolution, max pooling uh, flattened, and then two dense, then a dense layer, and then the output layer. If I wanted to add, um, Oh, so this is, sorry, this is using the functional interface, not the sequential interface. So again, each layer is a callable and we give it the output of the layer before as an input. And then we say uh, model with input equal to inputs and output equal to the output of the last layer. If I want to add skip connections, I can, um, do this by having an add. Um, so actually, uh, so this is also imported from the layers, uh, I think. And so basically what this says is I want to create a new tensor by uh, just computing the sum of this layer and this layer. And then I use that as the input to the next layer. And so this way I can uh, add skip connections. Here in this case, I'm skipping from um, from conf from max pool one to conf two two. So in this case here, this actually doesn't really work because the network is too small, and so this doesn't really help. Um, in this case here, because I skipped layers of the same size, uh, the number of trainable parameters after I add the skip connection is the same as the number of trainable parameters before I add the skip connection. So, uh, um, for the homework, you can try to um, create a network yourself in this way and add skip connections. 
but it's, it might be a bit tricky to come up with a good architecture. So there's a lot of architectures in Keras that are state of the art and that you could uh, use as starting points. Um, so that if you go to keras.io slash applications, these are all convolutional neural networks for image recognition that are in there. And I think they go from like, I think they are sorted by when they were added. And so, um, so I think, I mean, exception is newer than VGG 16 for sure. But yeah, who, who knows how they are ordered in this table. Um, but I think things that are interesting as like size, top one accuracy, uh, number of parameters in depth. And so top one accuracy, again, this is like image net accuracy for a particular model that was trained in a particular way. Um, and uh, size is quite important because, um, oh, well, size number parameter often uh, relates to how, hot, uh, how long does it should train this and or how long does it take to make predictions with this. There's not really a one-to-one -one correspondence, but um, you can see this mobile net and nest net mobile. These are, for example, very small networks that are meant to run on mobile phones. And these will be much faster to train uh, and they will uh, require less RAM or less um, GPU memory. A lot of these architectures are uh, quite complicated. And so I don't really want to um, talk through them. I just want to show you. These are here. You can uh, actually load them um, and just use them for the main part of the homework. I want you to train the neural network from scratch, though. So I don't want you to reuse the weights uh, that are trained here. One thing um, that's maybe a little bit interesting is that the last one to here, NASNet Mobile, NASNet Large, NAS stands for Neural Architecture Search. And so um, all of the networks before that are more or less learned, but what in, uh, with a little bit tongue in cheek is called uh, graded student descent, where basically uh, people tried a lot of things and someone found something that worked well. Uh, NASNet and, uh, is the result of neural architecture search, meaning they uh, basically did automatic machine learning using um, genetic programming to evaluate many different networks and search for an architecture um, that works well. And so this architecture was found automatically and not designed by a human. Um, I mean, there's like lots of clever tweaks to make the um, to make the search actually work, but uh, a big part of the search was automated. All right. So so far, we talked about uh, different architectures and learning a architecture. Uh, architecture from scratch using um, a gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. One of the things that has been uh, really successful first in computer vision and more lately in, um, in NLP has been transfer learning. And the idea behind transfer learning is that you learn something on one task and then uh, use the weights that you learned on this task for another task. This is something that we basically already did with our word vectors. So when we use the word vectors, we had this word embedding task um, that we don't really, didn't really care that much about, but then we found this word representation that we could use, say, for classification tasks. In computer vision, the transfer learning is usually um, done from a supervised task. In NLP, we had these self-supervised tasks. In uh, computer vision, Usually the transfer learning is from a classification task often an image net. So here, this is VDG 16. Um, so this was learned on a thousand classes um, to do classification. And the idea is that we can reuse um, the features that are learned by this to do um, 
computer vision task on other data sets and other tasks even. The idea is that these, uh, what is learned on these thousand classes uh, actually um, gives us a lot of information what, of what is in the image. We saw earlier, um, this network actually uh, learned to recognize faces even though faces wasn't one of the classes. And so the idea is that these thousand classes are broad enough that it, um, they require the network to learn a generic representation. And so the easiest way to do with transfer learning is to look at the activation of the second to last hidden layer, so the, the dense layer before the output layer, basically. And so here, in this case, um, this could, uh, I think, yeah, so this is 4,096 um, dimensional. And so you would have a feature vector of size 4,096, for example, that represents this image. And you, would, you could just throw away the last layer, which is the classification layer for the thousand classes. And I wanna give you a very brief example of uh, how this can be used. Um, so we only have a couple of minutes, so I'm just gonna uh, go through this briefly. So basically I wanted to build a classifier of uh, classifying uh, ball snakes versus carpet pythons. Um, maybe not the most practical thing, but uh, I kind of like snakes. So um, the way I created a training data set for this is I used the Flickr API. I don't know if any one of you remembers Flickrs. That's where people used to share images before there was Instagram. And they have a pretty cool API. And so I'm using their API and I just lo load uh, images that, that um, Respond to the search chain on ball snake, and then um, I do the same for carpet uh, for carpet python, and I find a hundred images uh, each. And so here on the left hand side, these are the results for uh, carpet python. On the right hand side, there for ball snake. You can see that they are not super clean as training sets go. So this is a ball snake apparently. Um, well, it's more a snake made out of balls, not, not the python I was looking for, but, um, well. So now I have, I have two classes and I have 100 samples each. And you can see there's a huge variety in these uh, images. And so if I just had 100 uh, images, if I just tried to learn like some logistic regression or random forest on this, there would be no chance I could learn anything from this because the variety is so so high and a classifier, like a standard classifier, could never learn anything uh, from so few samples. But if I now um, just uh, learn, say, VGG16, which is actually one of the older networks, um, with the uh, weights learned on ImageNet, this just ships with Keras. Um, I preprocess the input for the network. I call it predict, um, and then I compute a feature vector out of this, out of the activations of the last layer, and then I train just to just regression model from scikit-learn and I actually get a pretty good test accuracy um, of 82%. So, I mean, the data set is not super clean, so, and it's very few samples, but this would be completely impossible learning this from scratch with so few samples and such a high variability. And so this is how most people approach computer vision tasks these days, is just like use a network trained on, um, pre-trained on ImageNet and just extract features using this. Another thing that you can do is uh, fine tuning. So um, in fine tuning, basically what you do is you learn um, the output layer similar to what I just did, um, which is basically a, a, a logistic regression. But uh, once you learned this for a couple of um, iterations or a couple of epochs. You're also back 
back propagate the gradient through the network. And so um, you fine tune the network to your particular application. So I, I mentioned this technique also when we talked about BERT briefly. So this is the way people use BERT usually is um, by first learning, the, basically starting to learn a classifier, but then fine tuning after a couple of initial gradient steps, fine tuning the whole network to work well on your particular task. And so this is, you can think of this as being a very, very good initialization for the problem, much, much better than doing a random initialization. Um, if you want to fine tune, this will require more training data. Um, and so this is something that on the homework task, for example, this might work. On the, on the like 200 snakes I just had, that probably wouldn't work. All right. Um, so time is up, basically. Um, so I don't, this is all, the only things you need for the homework and the only things you need for the exam. Um, if you want to stick around, I will uh, talk for a couple of like for five or 10 more minutes about recurrent neural networks. We're going to only like really skim the surface on this one. And so um, I don't want to go over too much. And so if you, uh, if you want to leave, feel free to drop out. Um, but it's like, I think it's a very interesting class of, um, of models and something that's really, really used a lot these days. So recurrent neural networks are basically the counterpart to what we call feedforward neural networks. So feedforward neural networks, you had an input and you had from there on go, uh, um, some weights and then you had some hidden layer and from there you had more weights and you had all of these layers of activations and then you had some output in the end. In a uh, recurrent network, you usually have uh, a series that is the input. So, Often these are time steps, or they could be uh, steps in a sequence, like words in a sentence. And you can think of this as getting some input in, um, and uh, then producing some output. But you also have access to the hidden activations of the time step before. So um, this is why this is called recurrent, in that it can look at itself, basically. So um, you don't only have the input going to some hidden activation going to some output, the hidden activation can also look at itself. And so um, it, just looking at itself for the same input is not super interesting, but if you have a time series, as I said, and you look at the um, hidden activation for previous time steps, that can be very helpful. And so recurrent neural network in general is something where you have um, some notion of time or some notion of a series, and you have um, input weights, you have output weights, and then you have some weights connecting the hidden layer of a previous time step to the next time step. You can uh, also have multiple hidden layers, of course, like just in a uh, feedforward neural network, so there could be many, many layers, and each hidden layer could look at like the uh, predecessor. So this is, this is something that goes back again to the uh, sort of the 90s, but actually it didn't work very well, uh, backpropagating the error through um, many time steps. So if basically if you make a, let's say you make an error in time step zero and uh, it kind of bites you in time step 20, it's very hard to backpropagate because you're basically taking um, V to the power N um, and so this makes that propagation quite tricky. And so in 1997, um, uh, uh, Hochreiter and Schmidhuber um, proposed this thing called LSTM or long short term memory. So this has actually been quite a while ago. And basically it's a way to 
replace a single densely connected hidden layer with this mechanism here. So this is sort of like a wiring diagram. And each of these things corresponds to a different matrix. And um, because we have no time, I'm not going to uh, talk through what all of these matrices mean. But basically, um, at every time step, you get an input from the previous time step. Um, what the hidden activations were, you're going to also get like a control signal. And the control signal tells you how much should I look at the past and how much should I forget the past. And in a, in a sense, this is somewhat similar to the shortcut connections in residual networks in that it tries to create uh, a shortcut that allows you to go backward into in time more easily uh, or basically stop going backward into time. So it's something that allows the network to control how the gradient is propagated. And so uh, instead of just having a single um, recurrent weight, there's like uh, three matrices here. And um, they basically, yeah. OK, I'm, I'm not going to go through uh, all of them. But you see, it's quite complicated. Um, these, People mostly, when they talk about LSTMs, they forget what is inside, and they just say, oh, I have an LSTM layer, and it's a building block, and I use this building block to build my recurrent neural networks. And so they're kind of long forgotten, um, but um, then in the, in the 2010s, people really liked them again. Uh, there's an alternative, which is slightly simpler, which is by my friend from uh, Kim Young Shou from um, from NYU, uh, which is called the GRU, Gated, uh, gated Recurrent Unit. It's a little bit simpler. And so um, some people use that instead. It has only two matrices and only has a single stream of hidden activation. It doesn't also have a control stream. And so it works about as well, but it's somewhat simpler. But it's, I don't think it's as widely used um, these days. And so whenever someone talks about recurrent neural networks, they basically, they never mean the sort of vanilla version. They probably usually mean an LSTM or a GRU. And so as I said, basically people usually forget what's inside the LSTM. And uh, each layer is basically four interacting layers. There's four different nonlinearities in there. Uh, actually, there's five nonlinearities in there, I guess. Um, but people mostly forget about this and just th think of it as one unit that is connected. Uh, it connects the input to the output, but it also has a connection through time. And just one of the things that you can do with these that are like really surprising and really cool. Um, there's this 2014 paper that yeah, kind of blew my mind uh, back then, um, which is sequence to sequence learning. And what, what this does is it allows you to learn from an arbitrary length sequence um, to learn an arbitrary length sequence output. And um, this is used in uh, translation, for example. Um, so these days, like translation is uh, more complicated than this, but it's quite surprising that this works at all to me. So the idea is that you have um, an input sequence that is A, B, C, and the output sequence that, um, let's say, this is a sentence in English, and you want to get out the German sentence, and the German sentence would be W, X, Y, Z. And so... Um, you provide the input sentence, then you provide a special token that says it's the end of the sentence, EOS stands for end of sentence, telling the network it should start producing output, and then you look at the output. And um, so the first output is W. For, um, to produce the next output, you feed in W again, and then the, output, uh, the next output is X which you feed in again, and so on. And so you keep producing new output until uh, the network produces end of sentence. And um, 
So in this case, this would be the input, this would be the desired output. And so you can actually learn this just by doing back propagation. And this is, to me, this is quite surprising because it basically means that at this stage here, this hidden activation in this layer encodes the, the whole sentence ABC and has all the information that allows you to reconstruct up to, uh, w, x, y, z. And so you are able to encode the whole sequence within this hidden layer. Um, in, um, in practice, people didn't use like a single layer like this, but there's like um, several layers. And so here the input would be, I am a student, and then a sentence end token. And then there would be multiple layers. Um, and then there would be an output layer. And um, each of them would have a softmax. And you say, oh, what is here the first uh, bracket output? You feed this as an input to the next uh, time step. And um, you produce an output, and so on, until you see end of sentence. And so you can train this with sentence pairs and it will learn to translate languages. This is actually quite amazing because you don't, it's like the way this is uh, supervised is you give it pairs of sequences. You don't have to say this word translates to this word. You have to say this sentence translates to this sentence. So you only have to have roughly aligned documents and you can learn to translate languages just from that. And yeah, it, I think it's quite amazing that this works at all. Um, and so you can learn to translate between arbitrary sequences. And people have done crazy things with this and have done like image to text and text to image and uh, image to video and all kind of things um, with the sequence to sequence learning. Uh, very cool paradigm. People have used this also um, for question answering, where basically um, the input would be the question and the output would be the answer. So again, you would just feed it. Um, you just, it is just another instance of sequence to sequence learning. So um, you feed it pairs of question and answer, and you do back propagation, and it learns how to answer questions of the same form. This is actually like quite tricky, and if you do it this way, um, the question answering doesn't work that well. Um, there's one more ingredient that I'm not going to talk about, which is attention, uh, which basically allows these models to, fo to say, where in the sequence should I look at when I create my next output? And so attention models in the recent years have become quite important um, if you want to like do more complex tasks such as question answering. Um, okay, this was just a very, very brief overview of sort of how recurrent neural networks are used these days um, and so what kind of uh, architectures people are looking at. Um, one final thing, the last thing I want about neural network, talk about neural networks is um, they work really well, but they maybe don't work the way we thought they work. Um, there was a, a paper called Intriguing Properties of uh, Neural Networks, where um, they showed that if you're given a neural network, you can really, really easily cheat this neural network. So here, these are images. Uh, they're probably from ImageNet. Um, and so the image, um, so the neural network was uh, created to uh, classify ImageNet images. And so here on the left-hand side, the image is correctly classified as like, I guess, school bus, and then I don't know what kind of bird this is, um, and, uh, and so on. And then the image on the right-hand side is classified as ostrich. And um, 
you would say, well, the one on the left and the one on the right, they look exactly the same. And to the human eye, they look exactly the same. And um, in, here's actually the difference between uh, the two images. And for all of them, the one on the right-hand side is um, classified as ostrich with very, very high accuracy, uh, high certainty by the model. Um, these examples are known as adversarial examples because basically, uh, if you're uh, given the model, you can uh, create these, um, you can play an adversary and you can basically fool the model very, very easily. Um, and so some people were surprised by this. Um, if you think about it, it's not that surprising. These examples are found by doing gradient descent um, in the input space. So you're trying to, you're trying to change uh, the input so that the output is something that you want. Like here for all of these, they, they change the input such that the output is ostrich. Given how high dimensional the input space is, it's um, not that surprising that there you can change the input so that the model thinks it's an ostrich. Um, people have studied this quite a lot since then, and um, I guess it's it's a little bit um, so. I think so. Uh, I think the the uh, consensus so far is if you have the model architecture, you can always create. Um, adversarial examples. So you can't really prove your architecture against uh, uh, against attacks, or it's very hard to do that. Um, but most of these attacks require uh, to have access to the network, or at least to um, have access to many, many examples. So if you if uh, someone if you provide an API where someone can query your network uh, thousands of times, then he, they can probably create adversarial examples. If you have like some rate limit on your API, then it will be much harder for people to create adversarial examples. All right, I went way over, but I hope uh, this was uh, somewhat interesting. There's like so much research in this area and. Um, you, yeah, there's like, you could do a whole semester on linear networks, um, but I think this should be enough for now. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. So next time will be a, a, a quick introduction to time series and then, um, well, then the final. Okay, so there's two questions. One is, can you include adversarial uh, images in your training set? So adversarial images are with respect to a particular um, architecture, right? So the adversarial image um, was created to target or to fool a particular architecture. And so um, you could then retrain it. And like, if you have to, images that you were attacked with and you know the correct answer, then you can um, retrain the network. But if, if your adversary has access to your network, they can create um, new adversarial examples that will fool the new network. Um, I guess this is a little bit the idea uh, behind um, GAN's generative adversarial networks, but um, basically it's an arms race that uh, the person that tries to defend the network can't win. If the other person has access to the network, they can always create new adversarial examples. Um, another question is uh, how to do fine, uh, fine tuning. Do we take the learned weights as our initial weights and train the entire model on our data set? Uh, basically, yes. There's um, a small caveat in that, so the last layer of your network you don't know what to do, right? Because you have a different number of classes and your classes are different. If you randomly, randomly, excuse me, randomly initialize the last layer and um, then just train through the whole network, you're probably gonna garble all of the, this nice initialization that you did because um, the random initialization of the last layer will be very bad. So what people do in practice is they kind of do, um, a sort of warm-up phase where you train only the net the layers 
that you haven't initialized, so only the output layer or only the last two densely connected layers or something like this. So um, you only train the ones that um, you didn't initialize uh, with pre-trained weights, but you don't train them until the end. You train them for a little while, and then you allow the network to, tr to adjust all of the weights. So you don't want to um, just, from the first gradient step on, change all the weights in your network. You first just want to learn a little bit the, uh, the final layers before you start adjusting the initial weights. Okay, any other questions? All right, I'll, uh, and I'll see you Wednesday.